from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, my name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center here at the Library of Congress, and I want to welcome you today to uh, help us uh, celebrate the birthday of Edna St. Vincent Millay. This is the first of our literary birthdays events. We do six of them annually. Um, we're excited that uh, we bring in the spring with uh, Miss Millay. Um, let me ask you before we begin to take out your cell phones or any electronic devices that you have and make sure they're turned off. Um, the electronic equipment here is a little bit sensitive to, uh, to uh, the static that those uh, produce. Second, I want you to know that our program is being recorded and by participating in any way, you give us permission for future use of this recording. Uh, I can tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center, which uh, turned 75 this year. We are the home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry and we put on literary readings, lectures, and panels of all sorts throughout the year. Uh, in the back near the books, there is a list of our uh, spring events for 2013. Please pick them up and um, come. We have a um, literary birthday uh, with uh, William Shakespeare, Robert Penn Warren, and Catherine Ann Porter coming up uh, throughout the spring. Uh, you can also sign up our sign-up sheet, which is outside, to uh, get information about uh, our literary birthdays and the other events that we put on. We do some 40 events uh, throughout the year. Uh, and you can check us out online at www.loc.gov poetry. We have a new website that just came out today, so go check it out. We're very excited about it. Uh, you can read about Malay who would have turned 121 years old today and about our feature poets in our program, which were on your seat. Uh, we are thrilled to have two great American poets, Claudia Emerson and Alicia Ostricker, here from Virginia and New Jersey, respectively, to discuss Millay, read some of her poems, and talk about her influence on their own work. We are also happy to welcome any of you who are members of the Malay Society, who have done so much to support Malay's work here at the library and uh, across the country. Uh, we have some information on Steepletop, which is the home of uh, Edna St. Vincent Malay up in western Massachusetts, uh, 10 minutes from West Stockbridge, if you know where that is. Uh, it will be opening up uh, May 24th, so you can check it out. You can find out more information online. That's also in the back. Uh, Following the reading by our poets, who will come up in, in, in alphabetical order, uh, Verna Curtis from the library's prints and photographs division will say a few words about our great, great tabletop display of Malay materials in our collection. Uh, they're really, really lovely, and if you haven't gotten a chance to already come up and, and check them out, I, I uh, urge you to do so. Uh, Ms. Curtis will also talk about the invaluable work that prints and photographs does to ensure that future generations can continue to learn about the exemplar, exemplars of our culture like Edna St. Vincent Millay. So uh, without further ado, please join me in wel welcoming Claudia Emerson and Alicia Ostricker. Thank you, Rob, Caitlin, everyone for making this event possible. I'm Claudia. I'm very pleased to be here today to participate in the celebration of Edna St. Vincent Millay's birthday, and I'm particularly honored to share the podium with Alicia, whose work I've long admired. I'm going to talk today about the influence of Millay's sonnets um, that they have had on my writing, and I'm going to focus particularly on the sonnets in her Pulitzer Prize winning collection, The Harp Weaver and Other Poems, including Sonnets from an Ungrafted Tree the sequence that closes the book. My awareness of Malay began when I was a teenager in the 1970s, a time when I would not have read Malay in any of my English classes. I believe she was out of favor in the Virginia high school English curriculum. But a friend of mine had a grandmother who was a great 
reader with a wonderful library, <clears throat> the kind of library I had only seen in movies, the kind with a real fire in the fireplace, impossibly deep chairs, and it was there I happened upon a collection of Malay. I believe it was the collected Malay. Before I continue, I should confess to you that though I stand before you a practitioner of poetry for the past 30 years, I was never a young poet. When I was in my teens, I considered myself a writer of country songs and short stories, but not a poet. Nevertheless, I was a passionate, well, sort of hysterical sort who was drawn initially to Emily Dickinson's poems, those that I at least consider to be about love, and to Millay's sonnets, those that strummed fully the chord of despair that so often accompanied what I thought was love and love thwarted. Here's an example uh, from Millay, a poem I loved uh, when I was 15. I think it's uh, that kind of despair so fully unabashedly strummed. Pity me not because the light of day at close of day no longer walks the sky. Pity me not for beauties passed away from field and thicket as the year goes by. Pity me not the waning of the moon, nor that the ebbing tide goes out to sea, nor that a man's desire is hushed so soon, and you no longer look with love on me. This I have known always. Love is no more than the wide blossom which the wind assails, than the great tide that treads the shifting shore, strowing fresh wreckage gathered in the gales. Pity me that the heart is slow to learn what the swift mind beholds at every turn. I wrote everything when I was 15 with a rapidograph ink pen, all my letters small and lowercase. I took to copying Dickinson and Malay poems in my tight, small letters, not plagiarizing, to be very clear, just as a way of making mine, whichever poem I chose to send to whichever person had most recently taken and broken my heart. <laughs> my handwriting looks like a kind of intricate embroidery when I happen upon it now. And while I didn't know it at the time, the act of, of copying in your own hand the work of someone you admire is a kind of imitation, a ghosting of the original composer, a way of dancing with her shadow. It is only in the looking back that I can see that part of what had to have drawn me to Malay in these sonnets was not only the expression of drama and even melodrama, but its lyric containment, the restraint of the form that is vital part of the meaning. Her embroidered sound so far surpasses the obviously masterful and rhymes, her syntax and incantation, the passionate lyrical cadence, the irresistible integrity of the lines, the assonance and consonance so intricately entwined, great tide that treads the shifting shore, fresh wreckage gathered in the gales, all of which would have appealed to the songwriter in me and the anaphora-like pity me not, pity me not, until, the until at the Volta she reveals what she and so I have known always, the slowness of the heart to learn what even the 15-year-old mind had already encountered and would again. Here is another uh, favorite of the younger me, as despair filled and finally made. Loving you less than life, a little less than bittersweet upon a broken wall or brushwood smoke in autumn. I confess I cannot swear I love you not at all. For, is that, for, for there is that about you in this light, a yellow darkness, sinister of rain, which sturdily recalls my stubborn sight to dwell on you and to dwell on you again. And I am made aware of many a week I shall consume remembering in what way your brown hair grows about your brow and cheek, and what divine absurdities you say, till all the world and I and surely you will know I love you, whether or not I do. Is there any better composition of conflict, of indecision, of not knowing what everyone else must know about the stubborn heart that will not learn 
three well-wrought sentences, punctuated with absolute precision, lovely variation. I mean, for a high school student, just to see that many hyphens, commas, dashes, and a dramatic colon before the closing couplet, you don't really need your strunk and white, just read Malay. <laughs> And the example of repetition to dwell on you and dwell on you again, is there any better model of the importance of the sentence, the sense of the sentence within the ingeniously mannered form? Years later, when I turned in my third book to the sonnet, I was influenced greatly in my choice by Ellen Bryant Voigt's Curie, a collection Voigt calls a mosaic of sonnets or variations on the form. But it was around this same time that I taught in a summer school session a seminar on poetic meter and form, and a young woman in the class decided to do her final paper on Malay. I hadn't read Malay in years and was immediately drawn to sonnets from an ungrafted tree, but now as a grown woman, writing myself from the place turned subject of divorce, my own ungrafting, and struggling with an edge being honed one of part despair, part controlled emotion, part survival, and part resilience that came from a relieved period of solitude. I was working hard when I rediscovered Malay in the sonnet, teaching a hundred students a semester and writing intensive classes. And even though my divorce was an insistent subject for new poetry, I was also happily remarried to someone whose much loved first wife had died from cancer five years before. So though the poems in the book were coming from very different places emotionally, both sequences would benefit from my attention to sonnets from an ungrafted tree. Malay's sequence looks over the shoulder of a woman estranged from her husband who returns home to care for him as he is dying. These were the sonnets that I had rejected when I was young as dull with their ordinary imagery. The form, not so much the face of these poems, but their foundation something I, as an immature reader, hadn't been able to see. And also male critics of the day hadn't seen, some calling the poems, quote unquote, deficient in masculinity. <laughs> and the sonnet's appeal to me was immediate and very rich, multifaceted, bringing into play form, meaning, as well as a particular emotional intensity, beautifully restrained. I suppose I've always seen the creative process as a confluence of such elements, emotional urgency, time, and space. And by space, I mean the space where one physically writes as well as the poetic architecture. My new husband, Kent, commuted by train north of Fredericksburg to Woodbridge, leaving at seven in the morning and coming home on the 6.15. I gave myself from 4.30 or five o'clock in the afternoon when I left school until the train came in in the evening as my time for writing, and I chose to go to a local coffee shop near the station. The sonnet became a space I could handle over the course of the days it took to draft one. Those 14 lines were manageable in the time I had and necessary for the emotional intensity of the subject, a series of letters to Kent. These epistolary sonnets would be paired in the collection with poems written to my ex-husband. And while those poems didn't take the form of the sonnet, they were very much influenced by the tone of sonnets from an ungrafted tree. And obviously the fact that Voigt and Millet had chosen to write in sequence had great appeal. The sonnet is a particular architecture and whether one follows its rules strictly or is inclined to take liberties with, with such rules, the sequence becomes its own architecture, allowing greater possibilities with a narrative arc and with variation of the form within it. Here is the first of the 17 sonnets from an ungrafted tree. So she came back into his house again and watched beside his bed until he died, loving him not at all. The winter rain splashed in the painted butter tub outside where once her red geraniums had stood where still their rotted stalks were to be seen. The thin log snapped, and she went out for wood, bareheaded, running the few steps between the house and shed. Here from the sodden eaves blown back and forth on ragged ends of twine, saw the dejected creeping jenny vine, and one 
big apron, blithe, with stiff blue sleeves rolled to the shoulder that warm day in spring, who planted seeds, musing ahead to their far blossoming. We are taught as poets to show, not to tell, never tell, and yet here Malay boldly begins a narrative with blatant telling. So she came back into his house again and watched beside his bed until he died, loving him not at all. In a way, then, in terms of narrative, after telling this, there is nothing left to tell. I recall understanding as a grown woman, then in my early 40s, the power of this, and took this lesson to heart in the beginning of my own sonnet sequence. And though the poems I wrote to Kent are essentially love poems, I would also begin with some very telling language. Here's an example from my book, Late Life, the first in the letters to Kent. Artifact. For three years you lived in your house just as it was before she died. Your wedding portrait on the mantel, her clothes hanging in the closet, her hair still in the brush. You have told me you gave it all away then, sold the house, keeping only the confirmation cross she wore, her name in cursive chased on the gold underside, your ring in the same box, those photographs you still avoid, and the quilt you spread on your borrowed bed, small things. Months after we met, you told me she had made it, after we had slept already beneath its loft and thinning raveled pattern as though beneath her shadow, moving with us, that dark, that soft. When I began to draft the poems, I would write about my first failed marriage. I appreciated greatly Malay's use of domestic details, a rural landscape, the ways the woman confuses herself with that landscape, her husband's disappearance, her reality, a person she has come to care for out of a lingering sense of obligation, and the way Malay handles time, its compression. She is one of the poets who gave me permission then to mine my 19-year failed marriage, one that had exhausted itself against a similarly, similarly rural landscape to perform my own excavation of figures. Here is one of the divorce uh, epistles from my work. This one is called The Last Christmas. We were both sick. I had lost my voice. You were feverish coughing. I had to split the kindling myself. We'd been without power for two days, the spindling cedar darkening the room. The lines still sleeved in ice, sagged all afternoon above the arc of the ax, the lift and fall of the edge you made sure it kept. It was late when I watched the blade graze wood and keep falling toward me. I felt it brush my pants leg close as a cat, harmless. I quit then, certain I had let it fall where it wanted, not into seasoned wood but into me. Surely the ice would never melt, the pines would not straighten, I'd never speak. Later when I carried up your supper on a tray, you woke, pale, glazed from the fever breaking, and told me you'd worried when the sound of splintering stopped. You were sure you had gotten up from your sick bed to look out that very window. You said my mouth was open, but I was too far away and you could not hear me. I was small, mute, beneath the window frame, your breath forming, freezing on the panes until you could not see me, and there was nothing you could do. I spent the two decades of that marriage living in old farmhouses, heating with wood, hanging clothes on the line outside in winter where they did this thing I called freeze drying. Um, perhaps that's why this, the 11th of Malay's sonnets from an ungrafted tree is quite possibly my favorite. It came into her mind, seeing how the snow was gone and the brown grass exposed again, and clothespin, clothespins and an apron long ago, 
in some white storm that sifted through the pane and sent her forth reluctantly at last to gather in before the line gave way, garments, boards stiff, that galloped on the blast, clashing like angel armies in a fray. An apron, long ago in such a night, blown down and buried in the deepening drift, to lie till April thawed it back to sight. Forgotten, quaint, and novel as a gift, it struck her, as she pulled and pried and tore, that here was spring, and the whole year to be lived through once more. I absolutely adore the artifact, the apron as an article of repression, buried until spring, season we normally associate with renewal and rebirth being instead a sign, not that a whole year is to be lived through, but the, the whole year, as in the self-same, not survived, but doomed to be repeated. I also found lots of imagery from winter as I looked for similar metaphors of entrapment. One more poem, this one from my work called Chimney Fire. I learned to dread winter early before fall showed any real sign of itself. The world still filled with locusts, crickets, bees in the bone set, ashen moths quickening the dusk. dusk. Then around the time the hickory nuts came and began to fall, the tree far larger than the house and fertile with sharp husks that struck and struck again, startling the tin roof and me beneath it, I began to dread as well the silence I knew would come yoked to the cold. By then you'd cut and stacked the wood, cleaned out the stove. In late afternoons, we scoured the undergrowth for fat wood Skeletal sap for lighting the fire you rarely let go out. Every night you'd close the stove down tight before we went upstairs in the meager heat from that slow burn might keep the pipes from freezing, but it wouldn't reach the bedroom where we slept beneath layers leaden as water that would not float me, dense as mud beneath that water. In the morning, all our breathing had turned to ice, blooming like white lichen, on the insides of the window panes. One night, one winter, nearing spring, the fire would not be kept. The chimney caught it, and we watched, heard it pour up into the tree the fire would have consumed with the house if it had burned much longer. But slowly the flames turned back, receded to the familiar, rise of smoke, banked coals, my eyes, my mouth filled with ashes. In short, the whole year to be lived through once more. In the somewhat bizarre documentary, Malay at Steepletop, has anyone seen that little 20 minute video? There is footage of Malay in winter, her bedroom window open so that chickadees can fly to her hand and eat the seed cupped there. Lots of us, us creatures have sought Malay's hand in our efforts to find a way through a night, a winter's day. In that same film, an unidentified friend is reported to have said of Malay that, quote, one never forgot the things she noticed, end quote. I can't imagine any greater tribute to a writer than that, and I believe that in celebrating the day of her birth, we are also celebrating all of the things she noticed, and we will never forget. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Alicia. Can you hear me in the back? Is that okay? Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Edna, for being born and inspiring so many of us. Let me begin with a poem I loved as an adolescent, one of those Edna St. Vincent Millay poems that I had memorized 
before I even knew that I was memorizing it. Um, that probably has happened with to, to many of you. Your young brain just absorbs a poem and there it is when you want it. O oh world, this is God's world. O oh world, I cannot hold thee close enough. Thy winds, thy wide gray skies, thy mists that roll and rise, thy woods this autumn day that ache and sag and all but cry with color, that gaunt crag to crush, to lift the lean of that black bluff. World, world, I cannot get thee close enough. Long have I known a glory in it all, but never knew I this. Here such a passion is as stretcheth me apart. Lord, I do fear thou hast made the world too beautiful this year. My soul is all but out of me. Let fall no burning leaf. Prithee, let no bird call. Um, it seemed to me, uh, my Claudia, I was uh, probably around 13. It seemed to me as if the voice that spoke that poem was my voice, my experience. John Keats speaks in a letter of the true voice of feeling. The true voice of feeling is something that modernism tried hard to kill and that postmodernism has stabbed many times <laughs> with the silver dagger of insistence that language cannot mean anything. Yet it survives and is likely to go on surviving and this poem is an example here such a passion is as stretcheth me apart. What and where is this passion? Nature, the world, the self? Yes, yes, and yes. The feeling of intense joy so strong you feel when you're 13 as if you will burst? Yes. What does God mean in Malay's poetry? What does the soul mean? These are things I didn't ask as a 13-year-old girl, didn't need to ask because I knew. It was the same God as she speaks to at the close of Renaissance. God, I can push the grass apart and lay my finger on thy heart. A student of mine recently remarked to me that she believes in the God of the poets, not the God of the theologians. At the risk of stating the obvious, God, in Malay's poetry, exists in the world of nature and in beauty and never indoors. Here's a second poem I knew by heart when I was still a girl and felt it to be a part of me before I had anything approaching the kind of experience from which it derives. This one is a Shakespearean sonnet. Probably many of you know it by heart, or did. Love is not all. It is not meat, nor drink, nor slumber, nor a roof against the rain, nor yet a floating spar to men that sink and rise and sink and rise and sink again. Love cannot fill the thickened lung with breath, nor clean the blood, nor set the fractured bone. Yet many a man is making friends with death, even as I speak, for lack of love alone. It well may be that in a difficult hour, pinned down by pain and moaning for release, or nagged by want past resolution's power, I might be driven to sell your love for peace or trade the memory of this night for food. It well may be. I do not think I would. <laughs> what was happening to me here? Partly it was the training of my ear. 
the enjambment of lines three and four. Oh, you can do that with the end of a line and with the cadences that replicate musically what they are talking about. Nor yet a floating spar to men that sink and rise and sink and rise and sink again. The L's for lack of love alone, the sound effects of fill the thickened lung with breath. The repetition and caesura of the last line, it well may be, full stop. I do not think I would. You all smiled, you all got what the rhythms were doing as well as what it said. That off rhyme of food and wood. I think even as young as I was, I recognized that the proposal of selling love for peace or trading the memory of a night for food was ridiculous. <laughs> you can't do that. And yet there was something in there about love. Many decades later, if I set the close of the second quatrain next to William Carlos Williams, more now more famous quote, it is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. It strikes me that many a man is making friends with death even as I speak for lack of love alone is actually more true than what Williams says. And by the way, I bet he had read Millet's poem <laughs> before he wrote Asphodel, That Greeny Flower, which also, by the way, is also about the centrality of love in one's life. And now a third poem. This one, a Petrarchan sonnet, which is more difficult to write. Um, the, rhyme, the rhymes here are a, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, E, D, C, E. What lips my lips have kissed, and where, and why, I have forgotten. And what arms have lain under my head till morning. But the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for reply. And in my heart there stirs a quiet pain for unremembered lads that not again will turn to me at midnight with a cry. Thus in the winter stands the lonely tree, nor knows what birds have vanished one by one, yet knows its boughs more silent than before. I cannot say what loves have come and gone. I only know that summer sang in me a little while, that in me sings no more. Poems such as these uh, became an integral part of what I call myself. Their music, their endorsement of joy, their endorsement of eros. Um, in what lips my lips have kissed, there is a boast, the defiance of convention of so many of her poems mingled here with a quiet pain that combines the pain of the unremembered lads to whom she never intended to be faithful, along with her own pain for herself. You notice that though it is implied that the lads needed her more than she needed them as individuals, there is no sense of guilt here, only a recognition that time passes and one ages. It is taken for granted that Eros is all one, 
that lovers are interchangeable and yet love is precious. The word cry, the lad's word cry, becomes the word song and the experience of sexuality is at once supernatural and natural and aesthetic, a source of poetry and what is valued is natural and the poet is a tree, a girl for all seasons. So let me read a few poems of my own. I haven't written as many poems about simple joy as Millet did, but, but I read many of them and they became part of me. So here is one. This is called The Dogs at Live Oak Beach, Santa Cruz. As if there could be a world of absolute innocence in which we forget ourselves. The owners throw sticks and half ball tennis balls toward the surf and the happy dogs leap after them as if catapulted. Black dogs, tan dogs, tubes of glorious muscle pursuing pleasure more than obedience. They race, skid to a halt in the wet sand. Sometimes they'll plunge straight into the foaming breakers like diving birds, letting the green turbulence toss them until they snap and sink teeth into floating wood, then bound back to their owners, shining wet with passionate speed for nothing, for absolutely nothing but joy. So looking at this poem, I notice the word passion, which is one of Edna's words, and I notice sink at the end of a line whose enjambment then takes it in a different direction. Huh. Interesting. A couple of other poems about Eras. Um, and it's and it's it's very it's very clear to me that whether it's it's love responded to or whether it's heartbreaking love, love for Millet, Eras for Millet was divine. This is called Desire and Joy. Um, and it's, it's in a book uh, called The Book of Seventy and there's a lot of poems about death in it um, in the opening section. And then this is the beginning of the second section. The fear of death behind the scrim of words. You've said enough about that. Let fear be shut in the closet. Desire means you are inhabited by Aphrodite, that laughing witch. Her palms caress your breasts. Her body presses lightly against your body, inside your body, like an older sister teasing and giggling there. She warms the blood, and this is lovely. Then she heats it, and you go crazy, but cling to your craziness. And the object of desire doesn't matter. You turn him into Dionysus the savage. You would go with him anywhere. You turn him into Krishna. He comes to you in his flowing silk. His feet step lightly down the granite slope. You can hear his flute so clearly you soften for him. You are sure he's real. The sureness is joy. Um, and then um, 
one that is a bit, a bit like what lips my lips have kissed, um, the retrospective. Um, this is to Aphrodite. They call you the laughing one, Aphrodite, honey woman. I suppose because you laugh when our hearts crack like red eggs and we want to die. But you keep us on our knees, hoping, trying. Well, I am hurt and angry. You are aware I have adored you all my life, sometimes lounging in fur and coal, sometimes as a beggarly hag. For I recognized you in that poor disguise. And when the clock threw her arms in the air and I threw my legs around the moon, you climbed inside me like the surge of a wave. I could ride, I could sail, and anyone I kissed, I was kissing you, whom I fear I will never see again, never kiss again. With the few minutes remaining to me, let me mention that Millet suffered the fate of many women poets when she turned from the theme of feeling to politics, where she didn't stop feeling, but started demanding as well. This happened to Adrian Rich, it happened to Denise Levertov, and it might well have happened to Sylvia Plath had she lived. On August 22nd, 1927, the day before the execution of Ferdinando Sacco and Bartolomeo Vanzetti, convicted, we all think, falsely convicted of murder during the robbery of a shoe factory, convicted because they were anarchists. Millet was among the protesters on the steps of the State House in Boston, and on the front page of the New York Times was Millet's poem, Justice Denied, in Massachusetts. Here's that poem. Let us abandon then our gardens and go home and sit in the sitting room. Shall the larkspur blossom or the corn grow under this cloud? Sour to the fruitful seed is the cold earth under this cloud. Fostering quack and weed we have marched upon but cannot conquer. We have bent the blades of our hoes against the stalks of them. Let us go home and sit in the sitting room. Not in our day shall the cloud go over and the sun rise as before. Beneficent upon us out of the glittering bay and the warm winds be blown inward from the sea, moving the blades of corn with a peaceful sound. Forlorn, forlorn, stands the blue hay rack by the empty mow, and the petals drop to the ground, leaving the tree unfruited. The sun that warmed our stooping backs and withered the weed uprooted, we shall not feel it again. We shall die in darkness and be buried in the rain. What from the splendid dead we have inherited, furrows sweep to the grain and the weed subdued, See now, the slug and the mildew plunder. Evil does overwhelm the larkspur and the corn. We have seen them go under. Let us sit here, sit still, here in the sitting room until we die. At the step of death on the walk, rise and go. 
leaving to our children's children this beautiful doorway and this elm and a blighted earth to till with a broken hoe. The indoors in Malay always represents failure of energy and life force. Nature renews us, but not in this poem. I think she was thinking in part of the biblical admonitions by the biblical prophets telling us that if you obey God's commandments and ensure justice in the land, then the land will be fertile and fruitful. And if you dishonor the requirements of justice, there will be drought and famine and the land will die and you will die with it. Um, she went on writing many more political poems, popular at the time and decried by, um, by critics. Oh, she was not, she was not following her passions. Um, she was not expressing subjective feeling enough. Um, I have found myself writing increasingly about politics. Um, here's a poem called Listening to Public Radio. <laughs> La lutte continue. One. Every morning it feels increasingly like the world of the 30s our parents described and we have read about. When fascism knew what it wanted and descended over Europe like a light frost that suddenly becomes a blizzard, or like volcano ash coughing before it erupts, everyone saw it, but nobody could stop it, or not enough people wished to stop it, so nature took its course, the book of Job came true, the millions and the millions disappeared. Two. I am like one of those sheep in the hymn, sheep may safely graze, or a lamb in the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. When the wolves come growling from the woods of anger and hunger, I am not prepared. I have no idea what to do. I would have been trundled to the camps so easily, so without putting up a fight, that's right. I am among the cows, trotting, farting, pissing, shitting, crowded, bellowing toward the narrow gate. The metal head restraint, the stink up ahead, pouring out like a river, and after that, the stun gun, the blade, the steel hook, the axes, Ultimately, the plastic wrapping that protects the mate from air. Um, but let me end with a poem Malay published in 1934. Wine from these grapes I shall be treading surely morning and noon and night until I die. Stained with these grapes, I shall lie down to die. If you would speak to me on any matter, at any time, come where these grapes are grown and you will find me treading them to must. Lean then above, le above me sagely, lest I spatter drops of the wine I tread from grapes and dust. Stained with these grapes, I shall lie down to die. Three women come to wash me clean, shall not erase this stain, nor leave me lying purely, awaiting the black lover. Death fumbling to uncover my body in his bed, shall know there has been one before him. 
Um, and, oh, I didn't bring this up with me. Never mind. I think my 20 minutes are up. Uh, I have a poem called At the Revelation Restaurant, which is about knowing that you're going to die um, and loving your body anyhow um, and saying, I think I'd like the hors d'oeuvres, the soup, the salad, the entree, and the dessert. <laughs> I've never had to follow two poets, so <laughs> um, I guess we get back to the real world. If you'd like to come up after this wonderful program, uh, what you'll see on the table before you comes from the Prints and Photographs Division, a special collection here at the Library of Congress that has about 15 million visual images in their um, original state. And amongst all those collections, are some treasures f about Edna St. Vincent Millay. They come from various collections, um, and they stretch from 1914 to 1950 when she died. So the objects you see in black mats come from the New York World Telegram and Sun collection, which is a vast uh, morgue, as we call it, of news photography. So those photographs cover some of the events in her life uh, that were newsworthy, such as appearance on NBC and CBS radio um, when she was involved with protesting for Sacco and Benzetti. There's a photograph that was used in the newspaper. It's whited out just to show her face and neck, uh, which I think is rather interesting because it looked like it was very lyrical, but in the newspaper it looks very mundane. Um, but it announces her protest. And then there um, are some that speak of her concern for Lidice, I think that's how you pronounce it, the, um, mass the Nazi massacre in, the, in Czechoslovakia that she and many others were um, horrified by. And another photograph that shows her presenting a, a canteen ambulance uh, that was used, that, that was sent to Sierra Leone. I don't know the exact circumstances of that, but that's also in the 40s when she made a contribution towards feeding people who were starving. Um, there were several um, important photographers whom we recognize today who photographed her, and amongst them is Arnold Genta, who was a, an immigrant from Germany and we have an enormous collection of his work in the library. Uh, after he passed away, there, was, there were no heirs, so the Librarian of Congress sent some people to New York, and we virtually got his studio archive for shipping charges, and we preserved his work. And amongst um, his work are several photographs of Millet. There's one on the table in black and white. And then later, uh, we were presented with what has become the most famous photograph of her, I think, now. Uh, it's from 1914, and it was in the garden of the publisher Mitchell Kennerly in Long Island. It was originally a color autochrome, which was a process, the first color process we know that was viable. Uh, it was a decade old when Genta experimented with it and took the photograph of um, Millet. And so I have the original glass plate, but you can't see it very well. It's rather dark. And so we have a contemporary digital print that'll help you. And also in the viewer is another photograph by the same photographer, Genta, of another poet, Percy Mackay, um, the year before, 1913, when he appeared in a bird sanctuary mask in New Hampshire. But that's how the Malay glass plate would have been viewed through that dioscope viewer. Uh, the other important photographers who did uh, wanted to, to portray Malay uh, include Berenice Abbott, 
And we have several photographs of Millet by Abbott and a letter from Abbott asking Millet if she could photograph her, which is interesting. They came with the, it came with the photographs. Uh, these come from her um, manuscript collection. And another woman, Jessie Tarbox Beals, it's the one of Millet and her husband. I think it's in Je Greenwich Village outside their house. I think it's probably one of the more characteristic of her photographs that we have on the table because it, it has humor, it has the out of doors, it has some of the things um, the poets here have remarked on today. So take a good look at that. And the largest photograph is by Carl Van Vechten, who was a New York photographer and photographed all the important people in the arts at his time. So please enjoy the table and um, come back and come to the Princeton Photographs Division if you're interested to see more. Thank you. Vernon will be up here uh, if you want to come up and look at the, the uh, photographs that we have of Edna St. Vincent Millay. Uh, thanks to both our readers, uh, Claudia Emerson and Alicia Ostricker, for a terrific, terrific event. I uh, hope you enjoyed the day. Uh, as I said, please do sign up our sign-up sheet outside. Uh, there are books for sale, not only uh, Millay's uh, books, but uh, books by our readers. I'm sure they would be happy to sign uh, copies if you're interested. Uh, and just a little over a month from now, we will be celebrating Robert Frost's birthday here in this room, March 26th, with um, Dana Joy, the former chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, and Eric Pinky. So uh, you can find out more about our readings, including this one, at uh, www.loc.gov poetry. Thanks again for coming. Have a great day. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.